In the first chapter of the book of Daniel, we saw how Daniel's faithful observance of the law of God is rewarded by God, our Creator. Daniel and the three youths were trained for three years to be royal pages in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. And we saw that these four young men were Israel's elect. They were living in the palace with hundreds of other youths of the surrounding international community. These young people were brought in by Nebuchadnezzar to become future ambassadors and governors of their uh, corresponding countries, the country of their origin. Now, these four Hebrew lads were exposed to different ethics, different customs, a different diet, and an assortment of foreign gods from the pantheon of the surrounding world community. Youths from Egypt, Persia, Sidon, Tyre, Edom, Elam, Media, with different backgrounds and faith. The important thing here is that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were not influenced by the loose ethics of their colleagues. They studied together, they uh, trained together in all things, but they remained steadfast to the law of Moses. They were not shaken because they were living their faith. They had experiential knowledge of God. They were so much more advanced than a lot of our college-bound Orthodox today, who often become unrecognizable after four years at uh, today's catalytic university campuses. We have some statistics that about 51% of Christian children lose even their minimal faith that they took to college during their beginning semester. But not all of them, thank God. Those who were seriously catechized by their parents who lived the life of the church, they, they prayed in the house, they lived the divine liturgy and the sacramental life of the church, and they stay close to a spiritual father, then they don't surrender. They hold on. And these young people will not be any different uh, than some of the martyrs of the past. These few Daniel-like young men and women will be considered martyrs, just like Joseph of Egypt, Susanna, Daniel and his three companions. And God will give them wisdom and grace as well, because God does not show favoritism from century to century. They will be compensated, much like Daniel, who was full of wisdom and understanding. Three years after his palace training, he was more wise than all the wise men and the Chaldeans of his uh, country that he was living in, Babylon. His initial self-control, obedience, and resolve to adhere to the commandments of God until the point of blood will elevate Daniel into one of the great and major prophets regardless of today's unbiblical and unchurched and even atheist scholars. Last week we presented Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks, an amazing prophecy of the first coming of Christ. And yet academic scholars will teach in universities today in theological courses that the book contains no genuine prophecies and that the book was written in the second century BC and Daniel didn't really exist as a person and Jonah never really existed as a person and Adam and Eve were not a real person. And fairly soon they will be saying that, well, Christ was also a mythical person. Much like the Chaldeans during Daniel's age, these biblical scholars of representatives of worldly wisdom. And they are not orthodox. They do not have godly wisdom. They conjecture based on their intellect, intellectual knowledge. And according to St. James, such knowledge can be very demonic. Nine truths, one lie. A hundred truths, ten lies, much like our news media today. This is why it is extremely important today to stay connected to a traditional spiritual father, not only when you're at a university, but all throughout our lives. And we need to maintain a rule of daily prayer because the days are evil. The Orthodox Church 
and Christ himself acknowledges Daniel was one of the major prophets along with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They're called major prophets because their books are much lengthier than the 12 minor prophets who are not of lesser significance because their message is of equal value. Now Christ himself makes several references from the apocalyptic work of prophet Daniel regarding the abomination of desolation standing in a holy place, meaning the work of the Antichrist, as we will see towards the end of this series, and Christ will not be referring to a person that never existed. Today's topic includes a prophecy regarding thousands of years of world history. Daniel will reveal to the amazed king of Babylon that the main three empires that will follow his Neo-Babylonian empire. Sometimes we may get the impression that God is somehow outside of world history, or at least limited inside the things of the church. God is not limited at all, and he often uses sinful and godly and even depraved people to bring his plan to fruition. In the final analysis, everything serves the plan of God. In our present talk, we will see how God revealed a dream to Nebuchadnezzar with a prophetic dimension, and a real prophet was needed to interpret this dream. This dream needed to be recorded in history because it was not a dream concerning a year or two, but at least 600 years of world history. Here in this dream, it becomes obvious once again that prophecy and the future belongs to God and to those who receive the prophetic gift, the gift of prophecy. This formidable, fearless king who made everyone tremble in front of him was now terrified by a dream, a nightmare. Now, dreams are often the continuation of our daily or evening thoughts, and that's why it's a good idea to read something very positive and avoid any kind of bad pictures or uh, a lot of dramatic pictures right before you go to sleep because, you know, some of our dreams will be influenced by those pictures. So this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he went to sleep wondering what would happen to his vast dynasty after he dies. Now, this is, he, he must not be very old because this is happening in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, the second year of his reign. So he's having these thoughts, who would be able to succeed him and uh, who would be able to replace him? And of course, this is very human. We can wonder what will happen to our children and grandchildren, what would happen to our flock if we happen to be a priest or in a position of ecclesiastical authority. Who would take our place and how well will they do? So Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep with these thoughts, and in the course of the night, he had a nightmare that shook him up, took his sleep away. So the next day, he was still shaken by that experience, but somehow God erased the content of the the dream from his memory. So being quite demanding and arrogant as a despot, as a king of kings, as Daniel will call him, he immediately called all his magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, all the wise men, the Chaldeans, to appear in front of him at once. And he began to relate to them that he had this terrible dream the night before. He says, last night I had a dream and my spirit was troubled, but I somehow can't remember it. Its content is gone from me. Well, the Chaldeans and the wise men of his time, the intellectual and spiritual echelon told the king, king, Please try to remember this dream. You must remember your dream. And once you tell us what the dream is, then we will begin to interpret it for you. 
not knowing your dream, it is humanly impossible to be able to help you. Now the Chaldeans and the priests of the idols answer correctly and logically. And they farther said, there's not a single man upon the earth that can fulfill this request. You see, their experience is limited. They have no idea about the true God either. And in order to kind of protect themselves, they also said, and dear king, no such demand has been made of anyone else in the whole world. No king, lord, nor ruler asked such a thing of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. The king requires something extremely rare, and the answer cannot be provided by any human, but only by gods who dwell in heaven. It sounded reasonable, but not to, but not very convincing to a king who was very much used to having his way. He became furious, irate, and immediately he began to threaten them with their life. He said, if you cannot comply with this request, I have no use for you as king's advisor. Well, they were subsidized by the national treasury. So the king felt that he had the right to be demanding. And he said, I will cut you in pieces and your houses will be made a dunghill. The king was furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Unfortunately, this included Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah because they were also included in the wise men of uh, Babylon and they were also supported by the national treasury. The decree was final and when Daniel became informed, he approached Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, who was already beginning to slay the wise men of Babylon. It seems that Daniel was absent during this entire ordeal because the captain of the guard had to make the, this thing known to Daniel in chapter 2, verse 15. And Daniel asked, why is the, is the decree of the king so severe? Then Ariok made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and besought the king to appoint him a time that he might show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went home and shared the uh, information with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy of the God of heaven because their very life was at stake. So after a night's fervent prayer, the secret of the king was revealed to Daniel, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. After this thanksgiving prayer, Daniel rushed to Ariok, the king's ex executioner, and his first words were not, I got it, or we have the answer, or take me to the king. His first words were, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. This, this was what was in Daniel's heart. His primary concern was these people who were going to be executed. This shows the caliber of Daniel's heart. His heart was full of love for people who were not of the same faith, people who would later even become jealous of him. But his heart and soul 
was out for them and their families. Their well-being was a priority to him. This is so characteristic of the people of God of all ages. They are genuine children of the God of love. So he says, please stop the killing. I'm ready to give the king the interpretation. Now, someone can rightfully ask, why did God have to reveal his future plan to a ruthless and arrogant idolater like Nebuchadnezzar? Why not reveal his plan through Daniel, who was a prophet and so much holier than Nebuchadnezzar? The plan of God is often served by sinful and ungodly people, as already mentioned, because a prophecy can be made even by the mouth of a sinful person. Pharaoh of Egypt is also a type of the devil and an antichrist who persecuted the people of God. Yet God gave him the dreams with the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows and the seven wheats, the heads of wheat. And if these dreams were given to Joseph instead, who would believe Joseph, who was in the darkest jail at, of that time? And if the dream of Nebuchadnezzar were given to Daniel, a mere captive in uh, Babylon, how would this be of any significance? These events would not go any farther than a couple thousand people, perhaps, the company of Daniel and the uh, and the Jewish community. But now, because these dreams terrified Nebuchadnezzar, the king of kings, now the whole world is going to be informed because the king's palace will publicize these dreams. We had a similar incident with Balaam, the magician, the sorcerer who uh, was invited by Balak to use sorcery and witchcraft uh, against against the Israelites. So uh, the Midianite king wanted him to cast a spell on the Jews to curse them. We'll find this in the book of Numbers. Yet Balaam, who did not become godly by this uh, prophecy, eventually was killed by the Jews. And regardless of that, he spoke amazing Christological prophecies about the star of Bethlehem, the, uh, about the dawning of a bright star from the tribe of Judah. So this is a, a tradition that the, the Magi who came from Mesopotamia received perhaps uh, hundreds of years before Daniel. But I also believe, you know, it seems probable that these Magi who weren't Persia were also aware of the book uh, and the messianic prophecy of Daniel about the 70 weeks and they were able and of course by the uh, illumination of God to come and bring the three gifts to the Messiah. In a final analysis it's important to understand that everything serves the plan of God. In our days most of us have been convinced by our media uh, which is often in the service of the evil one, that Assad, the president of Syria, is a, supposedly a criminal and a terrorist, a monster, a killer who hates his people. Much like the propaganda that we heard a decade ago about Iraq and uh, you know chemical weapons, etc. Now, according to our local Syrian priest, Father Anthony, Assad of Syria knows the abbess of a nearby monastery. I am not sure of the name of that monastery, and I would not reveal it if I knew anyway, because of obvious reasons. And one night, two summers ago, the abbess heard a persistent knock on her door at one o'clock in the morning, and she heard a man's voice asking her to open. She reluctantly opened the door, and the president of Syria was standing in front of her. She knows him well, so she asked, Mr. President, uh, is there a problem? Where's your chauffeur? Uh, how did you get here all by yourself? He said, no, there's no problem. I drove here all by myself because this is a private matter between me and God. I heard a voice inside of me telling me, 
to come here at your monastery to pray. So I will go to the chapel. I will stay for one hour and please let me know when that hour is up so I can go back before anyone notices that I am gone. I want this to stay very private. Again, this story was told to me by Father Anthony Sabat, our neighbor uh, Antiochian priest here in uh, the Allentown, Pennsylvania area, who knows the abbess extremely well and visits her quite often. I mentioned this story to help us understand that not a leaf drops without the full knowledge of God. And we need to, uh, to, to help ourselves to expel our rationalism and stop believing everything we hear on the worldwide, worldwide deception on the screens called television and internet. Daniel reveals to us in his prayer that God is the one who changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. So much about climate warming and all these things. You know, we that's not so dangerous. The most dangerous thing in this world is our sinfulness against God, our sins, and not because God controls and changes times and seasons. He changes presidents and dictators if necessary. But let's get back to Daniel now who tells the king, my king, may you live forever. Of course, this was idiomatic speech of that time. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar that the one who reveals mysteries is God and God alone. I must also tell you, my king, that I don't have any special wisdom more so than your other wise men. This knowledge does not come from me, but God has revealed to me this knowledge so I can share it with you. Again, we see the modesty and humility and meekness of Daniel honesty, modesty, and humility that brought Nebuchadnezzar to bow down to venerate this 20-year-old youth of Israel at their meeting, at the end of this meeting. The builder of the Babylonian Empire, the king of kings of that time, fell down prostrate at the feet of this young captive Judean. So Daniel is not phased by anything, but he insists that I don't have anything more to offer you, more than my contemporaries. Everything that I will tell you comes from God. So Daniel's humility attracted the grace of God. God opposes the proud, but gives more grace to the humble. Daniel has a pure heart. He's not an opportunist. He does not use this event, this incident, to have the king's favor. He doesn't ask for it. And now he begins to interpret the dream. Your king saw a great statue, and the face of this statue was glorious and formidable. The head of this statue was composed of the highest quality of gold. The hands and the chest and the shoulders were made of silver. The waist, the stomach, and the upper legs were made of bronze. The lower legs were made of iron, and the feet were partly iron and partly clay. Now let's pay attention here to the downgrade of materials. We go from gold, silver, bronze, the waist, iron and clay. And then you continues. You were seeing this great image and suddenly a stone was cut without hands from a nearby mountain. It propelled itself toward the statue. It struck the statue at the feet of clay and iron and turned the feet into dust first. And then the entire statue fell with such a great force that the iron, bronze, silver, gold turned into fine dust and vanished. Subsequently, the stone that struck the statue grew into a huge mountain 
and filled the entire earth. And now we will reveal the interpretation of this dream before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You are this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was truly an amazing king. He conquered every other king of that era, and everybody trembled in front of him. He was a great warrior, and God has given all these things into his hands. So as we can see, God is part of world history. He's part of the Asian history, European history, American history, of course. And we need a very pure heart to come close to the volitions of God, to understand that God is the Lord of history. But God is righteous, and God is the Lord of time and space. And now Daniel continues that, yes, you're a great king. You're the golden king. But after you, there will be another kingdom inferior to yours. After that, there will be another kingdom, and that king will conquer the entire earth. There will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, and it will crush the others. So these are the three successive kingdoms uh, after the fall of Babylon. The uh, Middle Persians, and that's where we get the two hands, silver. The Greeks, the bronze, and the Romans. And during during the king of the fourth kingdom, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. What an amazing prophecy, 600 years before Christ. This is the prophecy. During the Roman kingdom, during the fourth kingdom after the fall of Babylon, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom during the reign of a Roman king. Now, let's listen to the scripture account that fulfills this prophecy. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So we can see how the evangelist writes down all this historical evidence. The Spirit of God is behind all this. All these real governors and real people to solidify our faith about this event that was prophesied 600 years before Christ. No other faith can do this. And Daniel continues in his chapter 2 of his book. You watched the king while a stone, a rock was cut out without hands. A rock broke off, was hewn off a nearby mountain without human hands. All of our church fathers agree that the spontaneous breakage of the rock from the mountain symbolizes the virgin birth of Christ. Christ's birth without the intervention of a man. The rock Christ came forth from the unhewn mountain called the Most Holy Theotokos and Ever Virgin Mary. You watched the king while a stone, a rock, was cut out without hands. And the rock is Christ, according to St. Paul. This is the rock that God placed on Mount Zion, which is another prophecy. This is the rock that will crush all those who get in the way. It crushed the Roman Empire in less than 300 years. The new Babylon, goddess Rome, was drowned by the blood of the martyrs who followed the rock. In less than four centuries, the heathen Roman Empire was miraculously transformed into the room, 
the Roman Christian Empire. The Nazarene prevailed as Julian the Apostate confessed when he was desperately trying to revive his pagan gods. Julian said while he was dying, the Nazarene has defeated me. And the rock Christ will defeat Marxism, communism, Zionism, all the isms. All these will be pulverized according to the prophecy of Daniel. Christ himself said, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone in Psalm 118.22. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes in Matthew 21.42. And Peter said, You are the rock and on this rock, Christ rather said to Peter, Peter, you are the rock and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Christ is the rock, and that rock became a mountain and filled the entire earth. The gospel has been translated to over 1,400 languages, because Christ told his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations, regardless of the merciless persecution in Egypt, in Turkey, in Indonesia, in Albania, and the entire world, the gospel is winning souls. And the prophecy of Daniel tells us that the mountain, the rock, will turn all the enemies into chaff, all the persecutors. And the final persecution will be the greatest. When the evil one, the opposer of Christ, who failed in heaven, he will now attempt to raise his throne upon the earth because his pride is incurable. He tried to place his throne in heaven and there he failed miserably and now he wants to be worshipped on earth. He failed with Christ, but in the end he will succeed to be worshipped by the Antichrist and most of the people on this earth. So at the end of this meeting, King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. And the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. So Nebuchadnezzar is amazed. He believes that the God of Daniel is a most powerful God, but of course he does not have the revelation that he is the only God. So he simply places the God of Daniel a bit higher than his own gods, Marduk and the Pantheon of Babylon. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Of course, and he saved their lives, so they should be uh, very appreciative at this point. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and again, here is the greatness of Daniel. He doesn't forget, he doesn't forget his three companions. He asked the king to also give them a position. So the king set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, now these are their Babylonian names, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. He stayed in the palace as one of the king's chief advisors. In a future talk, we will, we will be able to... Uh, to see details about these three vast empires, these empires that will subdue Judea for a span of 600 years, the empire of the Persians, the, the Middle Persians, the empire of the Greeks, the Romans, and their leaders. Daniel saw all this in an amazing vision, in his vision of the four beasts. Oh